Welcome back to College Algebra. Today we're starting a new unit. Really, this is going to serve as the prototype for the rest of the semester in that we're going to talk about classes of functions pretty much from now on. Uh, I guess we'll have a digression right at the end when we talk about systems of equations. But for right now, we're going to talk about linear functions and then quadratic functions later in the chapter. And then in chapter five, we'll talk about polynomial functions. So at this point in the semester, you've probably gotten used to seeing the word linear. Linear means, as an equation, it just has powers of one on the variable. That's still true for a function. Let's look at the definition. A linear function is a first degree polynomial function. We'll look at polynomial functions in general in chapter five. But here is the form. You may recognize the formula, mx plus b, that is the equation of a line. And remember, when we introduced function notation, this was just a replacement for y. So this is literally the slope-intercept equation, y equals mx plus b. The average rate of change of a linear function is its slope. You could even get away with not calling it the average, it is literally the rate of change. Domain of every linear function is negative infinity to infinity. Range is the same unless the slope is zero. Why that? Well, it's not that hard to see when you think about it. If you think about a function that has zero in place of the slope, it is just f of x equal, say, zero x plus b. Obviously, the zero x goes away. B is just a constant. So it's like graphing something like y equal four. If you look at that graph, one, two, three, four. That's just a horizontal line. Horizontal lines have slopes of zero. And its range would just be the number four. So in that case, its range would be just the number, curly braces, four. Roster notation. Haven't seen it a lot since, ooh, back in chapter, chapter R? The review chapter. But yeah. Range is just going to be negative infinity to infinity if it's tilted at all. If it's flat, it'll just be a single value. All right, let's do an exercise. This is based on exercise 35 from the textbook. We're instructed to find where f of x equals g of x. Well, we could just set up y equal negative 5, and we could find the formula for this equation because we certainly know the formula. Uh, it goes, let's see, the slope would be up negative 5 to 7 would be 5 plus 7 is 12, so y equal 12 over, and it goes from negative 10 to positive 5, that's 15, so that's the slope, plus b, and then you can just use one of these points, so let's say use the 5, 7, 7 equals, um, 12 fifths, so that's a uh, four four fifths times five plus b. So b plus four equals seven. B equals three. So this equation is y equal negative five. This equation is y equal four fifths x plus three. And then you could say, well, then when are they going to be equal? You know. This is what? This is f of x. This is g of x. So you could just set them equal. And you'd get negative 5 equal 4 fifths x plus 3. Move the, five o move the 3 over. Negative 8 equal 4 fifths x. Divide by 5, 4 fifths. So that's multiplied by 5 fourths. Because remember, to, multi to divide by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal. 4 reduces, and we get 2 times 5, so that's negative 10. Now, we didn't need to go through any of this, because the whole point of this is to recognize graphically what you're doing. Where are these two functions equal? Where are their solutions going to be the same? Well, at their intersection. Remember, a graph is literally a drawing of every solution. so where they intersect is going to be a solution of both equations. 
So here's where it is. And as for whether it's the x value or the y value, well, how do we always set up an equation? We solve for x. So yeah, it's negative 10. That's the answer. That's what we put in. Negative 10, not positive 10. There we go. For which values of x is g of x less than or equal f of x less than h of x? Well, g of x is here. To be less than, for the y value to be less than f, has to be in between here, well, to the right of this point, because that's the only place that this diagonal line is above this flat line. But it also has to be less than h. So the only place f is less than h and greater than g is in between these two points. So in between negative 10 and positive 5. So for every x in the interval, negative 10. See, they want interval notation. And let's see, g is the bottom, so that's going to get a bracket, because we do have a less than or equal there. And the top is strictly less than, so 2, 5 with a parentheses. There we go. We could have solved it the same way we did here, by finding the formula of the equations and doing the different work, but why? We've got a graph. It's good to have a graphical understanding. Let's do an application. So suppose that the quantity supplied, S, and the quantity demanded, D, of t-shirts at a concert are given by the functions where P is the price. So S is the supply, D is the demand. Supply is how much vendors are willing to supply to you. Demand is how much you can sell, basically how many people will want them. Find the equilibrium price. Equilibrium price is where demand equals supply. So, easy enough. Where demand equals supply, S equals D, is where negative 340 plus 40P equals 1100, one more, one minus 50P, 50P, there we go. Uh, solving this, I guess I'll move the 50 over, move the 340 over, that'll get me 90P equal 1440. So P will be 1440 over 90, which is 144 over 9. Which, let's see, divide by 3, the top becomes... <laughs> Forty-eight divided by three again, you get sixteen. So the equilibrium price is sixteen dollars. Don't need to round because I already have a round number. What is the equilibrium quantity? Well, that's when quantity demanded equal to quantity supplied, so I just need to take 16 and plug it into either one. You should get the same thing no matter which one you plug into. If you plug into demand, you get 1100. I need another one. 1100 minus 50 times 16. Which, multiplying by 16, 16 is 2 to the 4th, so multiplying by 16 is just like doubling something four times. So 50 doubled is 100, doubled again is 200, doubled a third time is 400, doubled a fourth time is 800. So it's 1100 minus 800, which is 300. And if you do the same thing up here, 340 plus 40 times 16, well, double it. 80, double it again, 160, double it again, 320, double again, 640. Oh, it's negative. Negative 340 plus 640. Once again, 300. Yep. Only need to plug into one of them. 300 t-shirts is our equilibrium quantity. 
Determine the prices for which quantity demanded is greater than quantity supplied. All right, well, I'm just gonna take my work here and say, okay, uh, quantity demanded was this one. So if I set the inequality going that way, I just added and subtracted, so that won't affect it. Divided by a positive number, so that won't affect it. So P is less than 16. And I think the other bound would be zero for the price of 16. Oh, zero is less than P. Less than or equal 16. Quantity demand is greater than quantity supplied. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my I should have used the strict inequalities. I didn't think about it. The uh, the price could be zero, in which case we'd have very high demand. It can't be 16 because at 16 they're equal and we specifically want the quantity to demand it to be greater than not equal. So what will happen to the price of t-shirts if the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied? So if we have more demand than we have supply generally what happens then is your price goes up because if an item is scarce you can charge more for it for our last exercise we'll do in this section we're going to look at this application where we have a truck rental company is renting a moving truck for one day by charging $32 plus 8 cents per mile. So we're going to write a linear equation. Remember, a linear equation is just f of x equal mx plus b, although I think they want us to do c of x in this case. And they want x to be the number of miles driven. What is the cost of renting the truck if the truck is driven 180 miles? All right, well. How do you calculate cost? We know we're going to have to pay $32 regardless. If we don't drive the truck at all, we'll still have to pay that. So how am I going to put that in? Well, it's just going to be a 32. It's not going to be multiplied by anything because we're not paying it multiple times. We're just paying it once for the day, I guess. And then eight cents per mile. Well, if X is the number of miles, I get charged eight cents per mile, how much am I getting charged? I mean, you just multiply it. 0.08X. So I actually wrote it in reverse order. I mean, this would be the B and this would be the MX, but it's still a linear function. 0.08X plus 32. These integers are decimals, do not include the dollar symbol. What is the cost of renting the truck if the truck is driven 180 miles? Easy enough. X is the number of miles, so C of 180 equal 32 plus 0.08 times 180. 8 times 180 is 360, 720, 1440. Times 0.01, that's going to move the decimal place two places to the left, so that's 14.4 plus 32 equals 46.4, so 4640. 478 miles. Yeah, I'll bring up the calculator for that one. I think I've, dist I think I've demonstrated the point well enough.
32 plus 0.08. Oh, got an extra point in there. 0 0.08 times 478. $70.24. That's it. Next time, we'll talk about quadratic functions. Uh, there's a fair bit more variety to that, both to the applications and to the problems themselves. Honestly, as we get into higher polynomials, we'll probably have more complexity as we go. See you in the next video. Have a great day.